Genevieve. You're heading away from the Seine, slightly confused, slightly unsure of Marcel's fate, but heading in the direction of the cafe when the skies open up and the bloody rain starts falling. You have a choice. You're not at the cafe yet. You can try to reach there. You know all of the city's nooks and crannies. You could probably stay safe from the storm. Or you know there is a passage underground. You're not sure where it goes. You could probably get to it before the worst of the storm gets to you. And you would be with Marcel. To where are you drawn? It raining blood doesn't seem like something I should try to trudge through. It doesn't seem to you like a healthy option to stand outside and expose yourself to the elements. No. So I'm looking for somewhere close to take shelter. You uh, duck into a clothing store that is open, although there aren't any customers within, just as the front window starts getting pelted with rain, and just like blood would, it doesn't just run down like water, it spatters, it stains, it congeals around the corners. The tailor in the shop is stood there open-mouthed. Mon Dieu. What is going on out there? Madame! You are out there. What is going on? We must lock the door quick. This might be some weapon. He runs up to the front door, puts the lock across, takes the time to flip his sign to closed. We must hide in here, madame. Until this passes, this could be some biological weapon. My my cousin, he was in the Great War. He, he, he was... He fell victim to a gas attack. He, he described how sometimes there was yellow and, and brown rain. This, this could be the same thing. This could be some chemical weapon. I feel like I'm en- entranced by, by the way that the blood runs down window pane. But I also know that it might not be a great idea to stand close to the window in case this is a weapon. So I follow the man and very intensively listens to what he has to say. But there's just something that kind of makes me, it makes me disconnect from what he's saying. Like, I don't believe that this is a weapon. It's more, it's closer to a plague or something godlike. The f- sudden flash outside the front window draws both of your attention. Someone trying to run through the storm is struck by lightning and collapses just outside the front door. Ah! Sacre bleu! What do we do? No, no, we cannot open the door. We cannot risk it. We cannot save them. It could, they could be infected with something. Madame, I, I have I have a telephone upstairs. Uh, I I will see if I can I will see if I can get some aid. You you stay down here. You'll make sure no one gets inside the 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 shop. You understand? Yes. He runs upstairs. I think I move closer, so if I can see the man who was struck. So like, if is he is he moving? Is he breathing? Uh, he seems to be breathing shallowly, uh, though you're not sure how long that's going to last. The burn marks down his body from being struck by lightning are quite apparent. His flesh has been boiled away, scorched away by the lightning bolt. It reminds you in many ways of hands and his burn wounds, except this person isn't in a German uniform. So I just watch as this man's life kind of like starts to fade. I feel a bit melancholic. You see a uh, 
couple of people on the other side of the road. It's the old man and old woman you saw before, but they no longer have the pram. They're clutching onto each other. They're weeping. They look absolutely horrified. Confused. They have no idea what's going on. How to combat it. How to endure it. You're not even sure they know where they are. They're looking around with glazed expressions. Their clothes quickly becoming sodden with blood. Raining down from the heavens. But I think Genevieve just continues to look out the window. A bit still very much in awe of what is happening and emotionally disconnected from the lives that are in danger. You hear the footsteps of the shop owner make his way back downstairs. Madame, this is taking place the entire city over. Nobody seems to know what is going on. I listen to the radio briefly. There, There's nothing but confusion. It's, it's as if everyone is going insane. Madame, oh, did you get any of that on you? I take a quick look on me and I'm like, I'm serving, do I have any blood on my clothes? Not today, and he's looking at you very closely as well. No, I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, I, I do not know, I do, I do not know, I do not know if I can, I can, if I can trust you, if I can trust you. No, no, I think it is, uh, I think it is best that you should leave. So, don't you believe that is the madness taking hold of you? I am, I am not, I am not succumbing to anything, I have not been out in that, I have been here all morning, you were outside just as it started, for all I know, it, it hit you as a mist, and it, 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 it uh, for, for all I know, for all I know, you've been drinking it, you've been drinking that blood, no, you, you, you get out, you get out right now, he points toward the door, repeatedly. Uh, I don't really want to go out there. It looks fucking dangerous. Get out! Get out of my shop! No. He strides toward the counter, and he pulls a plank of wood off the front of the counter with surprising strength. It's very much an improvised bludgeon, and he swings it uneasily, but with intent. I will cave your head in if you do not leave my shop. You've gone completely and utterly mad. I don't have any blood on me. You're just crazy in your war fantasies. How did your how did your brother, friend, cousin, person even survive a ah. gas attack? You just made ah. that up. Ah. I, I I am not I am not I am not ah. He he swings the plank at you. Could you do a dexterity and athletics roll, please? I think I'm going to use willpower. Two ones, but one ten. Well, the ones are only really bad if you score no successes at all. So this was a really bad roll. It's a one ten, two two one. You are able to just narrowly duck underneath the plank as it swings above you. It catches your hair and actually rips a few hairs out. But you think it must have got caught on a nail or something like that. But there's not really much time to think about it as he's about to swing the other way. He shouts at you again, screaming. And you can see from his face that he has succumbed to absolute shock and paranoia. Get out! Get out! Get out! No way I'm going out. Your options are you can tackle him unarmed, you could uh, attempt to pick up or go for one of the clothes rails, or even try rushing him with a dress. Uh, That may sound ridiculous, but it's the kind of thing you could potentially bundle over his head so he wouldn't be able to see. You, You have a few options. Anything that you can imagine being present in a clothing store is theoretically here. In that case, is there like a... uh... Oh, what are they called? You know those things that you kind of like hang your coat on? I kind of want you like grab one of those. Okay, you're able to grab the coat hook without any issue. You are now armed with your own makeshift cudgel. Ah, I see, I see, I knew, I knew that you were. 
I knew that you were affected as well. So you recognize that you're crazy too. Well, that's great. I meant like that people out there. Now you get out. I am stronger than you. I am bigger than you. You cannot. You cannot scare me. I ignore the threat. And I decide to try to attack the man. Excellent. Go for your dexterity and weaponry roll, please. Again, you can always use willpower. Uh, okay, so we have one success. Tell me, how does Genevieve strike the tailor? With my improvised weaponry, I decide that, well, he's taller than me. Either his, like, abdomen or lower, I just sort of, like, jab the man. Okay. That's absolutely fine. Could you... Uh, what is your strength, Genevieve? Uh, my strength is two. Okay, this bludgeoning attack with the coat hook isn't enough to disable the man entirely, but you drive the wind out of him by essentially lancing him in the midriff. It's a little like a joust. You jam the coat hook into his abdomen... And you hear the wind escape him through the mouth. He doubles over, and his attempt to swing at you is cut short. You could possibly bring it down on him for a coup de grace. Exactly, that is what I want. I want to swing at him while he's almost down. Okay, let's do another dexterity and weaponry, and again, you have your willpower. So at this time, let's try without the willpower, and it's a six. Eight and four, so one success. Okay. You you crack the tailor across the back of the head with the coat hook, and he crumples to the ground unconscious. You can keep hitting him if you like. It is tempting. It's been a while since you've had a body unconscious in front of you. It is tempting. But is this the kind of body you want? Mm. Right now, I am. I have the benefit of easy access to the call due to this base. But I'm thinking that perhaps now is not the time. But I might as well just vent out some of the frustrations after them. I think I hit him again. So you're going to bring the clothes hanger down onto his head repeatedly? Just once to make sure that he is knocked out. If he dies, then he dies, but... You bring it down with all of your strength onto his temple. You hear a satisfying crunch. He's not dead. And you're no doctor. But, judging from the blood that's now oozing out from his skull, you're not sure how long he will last. I'm going to cut back to Marcel. Marcel, you get to the bottom of your ladder. Uh, are there other people down here, as the guy suggested? There was a woman sat on a chair, and as you started climbing down the ladder, she stood up. She has a pistol trained on you as you're descending. He, he just sort of looks suspiciously at them. Carol, glad you were down here. Look what I have found. He gets to the ground as well. This is one of Raphael's. I believe your name is Marcel, is it not? Well, there you have me at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Marcel, this is Carol. Carol, this is Marcel. We've been watching your group for some time. Have you? Hmm. And why would you be doing that? Oh, well, all will become clear. Uh, we're going to take you through into the bath chamber. The, the bath chamber? That is correct. Please, this is not far. And then we will be able to put all these weapons away and talk to each other like gentlemen. You've made me promises before, stranger. And so yet it seems that you are not really in a position to argue. He just sort of sighs um, and just sort of waits to be shown where it is actually his to go. He pokes you with the knife again. You're facing the right direction. Keep walking. And off he goes. You should know, Marcel. 
that your leader Raphael, he was not a talker. There was much we wanted to know from him, and he... His lips were sealed, as they say. He doesn't say anything. Very disappointing. Uh, loyal to the end, even. When he was of no further use to us, we made sure he found his way into the Gestapo's hands. He's dead now, anyway. He was <laughs> all but dead when we handed him over. Isn't that right, Carol? Hmm. I see, so you're collaborators then. No, <laughs> no. Monsieur, we uh, uh, have been around a lot longer than the uh, Third Reich, and we will be around a lot longer than it remains, I am sure. Ah, so you're just foolish enough to believe that you can use something so evil. They make for good body disposal facilities. That is about the extent of my association with the Nazis. Ah, here we are. He shows you to what looks like an ornate Roman bathtub. You can smell a ready metallic stench, and suddenly there's a crack of thunder that you hear even this far underground, and the incredibly loud pelting of rain. Thunder rolling constantly, both the blonde-haired man and Carol are looking upward despite the fact it's a solid ceiling above them. Their eyes are off you for just a second. Um, what's, is that knife blade still in my side? It's dropped an inch or two as he looks up. I know what side it's on though, right? Yes. I'm going to sidestep the other way just very quickly and just try to snatch out of his hand. Okay, let's go for a dexterity and brawl, please. Um, and I'm quite desperate, so I'm going to spend a willpower. Very good. Plus three dice. Uh, that is an eight, four, five, two, ten, two. With a good array of successes, while the blonde-haired man is distracted, you grab the blade from him, turn it around. What are you doing with it? He's going to interpose the man who he's just taken the knife from between him and the woman with the gun um, and l- just not stab him with it at the moment, just put it under his chin so that it's like, if I just take a step forward, this is going in your neck sort of thing. Uh, monsieur, monsieur, do not, do not do anything hasty. Don't try to bullshit me again. I bullshitted with the best and bullshitted with better than you. You with the gun, drop it now or I'll walk straight through him. What makes you think I would care? He has taught me all of his secrets. Do not do not speak like that, Carol. It is true, though. You have taught me all of your secrets. I really do not care. I find you quite loathsome. If you have to open his throat, then you go ahead. But the gun stays on you, Marcel. And you think those bullets will penetrate this man? There's one way to find out. I suppose there is. His eyes narrow as he hears the divine judgement coming down from on high. Um, I mean, he doesn't know for a fact that that's what this is, but he chooses to believe it, his zealous um, sort of initiation into the cult. Um, He's not just a a lowly peon. Um, He is a a true believer at this point. Um, And he feels his his god-king's power seeping through the the very lifeblood of the city through the, the soil and the cobblestones above and empowering him with probably some sort of false Dutch courage that he has lacked for most of his life. And he just like runs forward, um, basically sticking the knife in his neck if he can, and then he's just going to try to push him and use him as a human shield and just barrel him into the woman if he can as he goes. That's excellent. Let's do a strength and brawl, please. And she is going to be letting off a shot. If she scores a sufficient number of tens, I think she's still going to hit you. Yeah, I have three successes. Nine, nine, eight. Wow, and she does not. As you barrel the blonde-haired man forward, jamming the knife into his neck, 
I assume you're pushing deep. He's just running. So yeah, he's, he's pretty much just thr- like if you want, he was pointing it with a straight arm. So he literally just runs his full weight into the guy. Um, and, and then you gra- impale him grabs him as he goes. Yeah, but he's up for killing him at this point. Yeah. Mm. She lets off a shot. It hits the blonde-haired man square in the chest. It doesn't slow your pace at all. The bullet doesn't cut through his body. And you collide with her. Carol, as she has been identified, teeters and tumbles backward into the Roman bath with a crack. The back of her head hits the tiles. Now that you're looking into the bath, you can see that it's horribly stained. It's clearly seen recent use, but you can tell from the odours down here, uh, from the... Now that you're seeing it, the sheer amount of bugs. There's even maggots crawling in the corners. This chamber's been used to store blood or offal or meat. And now that you you saw that discoloured water in the Seine and you're looking at the drainage chambers in the bottom of the bath it's a fair guess to where this outlet exits she looks dazed the gun is at her side he'll try to quickly collect himself and gather that up that would require you to jump down into the bath as well Oh, she's in the bath? Yes, uh, when ah, you bumped right. into her, she fell backwards into it. Aha. Um, well, I'm not leaving her in cover with a gun. Um, keep Trying to keep the knife in hand for now. Um, yeah, he, he'll leap in, um, just press the knife down towards her, like, lift the gun. Um, he, he'd like to get information out of her if he can, but he is prepared to do her in at this point. She's still conscious, but dazed. Please... Please show some mercy. Mercy? Mercy? You have sinned against France, against the true saviours of the country, the gods of Erem, and me. Why shouldn't I just blow your face off right now and leave you as dead as your pathetic friend over there who thought he could threaten one of the followers of the true god? I I, I know Amasis... He is He is my friend. He would he would want for me to receive mercy. The same mercy you showed his high priest, perhaps? If it was necessary, we had to. Why? Speak, damn you! He thrusts the gun into her face. We needed to know where Amasis was. But Raphael would not tell us. And what do you intend to do with that knowledge? Her vision is becoming more lucid. She is focusing on you now. I have been alive for well over a century now, Marcel. How is that possible? Through the same acts of sacrifice that have kept Charles there. She points up at the edge of the bath alive for that long sacrifice the letting of blood the same rituals that have kept Amasis alive around deathless for so long don't toy with me you're you're not the same as Amasis no we, we could never be it is not the same sorcery I do not know what the sorcery is it was Charles who who told me that there are two ways of achieving immortality to us rank mortals the letting of blood and the preservation of youth through it or the draining of of relics of vestiges of Irem when when I was last with Amasis, many years ago, he entrusted me the safekeeping of our relics, all of our important, our holy items uh, of the cult. But I knew that he would be sleeping 
soon thereafter, and I, I was afraid that he would not wake again, that I would never see him again, that I would never discover the path to the same immortality that he has. And so? Charles gave me an offer. He said he would teach me how to be an immortal. All I had to do was deliver the relics. And for a time we both feasted on them, and we did not have to let much blood at all to preserve our youth. Instead of blood, we bathed in Sechem for want of a better explanation. And we remained powerful and invigorated, but though eventually those relics ran out. And so the bloodletting started again. By that point, I had lost complete track of where Amasis' body was. His cult over the years has been so... prestigious at hiding him and moving him. It was to my surprise that I heard that he was back in Paris when I was able to find out about Raphael. We tried to get answers from him. And he would not give up our god. Please, I, 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 I have never had any intention truly of crossing a masses. The reason I have sought immortality for as long as I have is so that I could serve him when he next awoke. If I had just tried to live out a normal life, I would never have been awake for the next time he arose. I, I did all of this so that I could serve him forever. You know, I think you're right. I think he would very much like to meet you. Well, we're going to be cutting to Amasis now. The street outside the cafe has cleared of people, except you occasionally see someone crawling by, babbling, clawing at their eyes, fighting against the tide of bloody rain and howling wind, but mostly there is little life. Your kefir, your connection to your cult is a buzz. You know that they are in danger. You know that they are just as at risk of this storm as any other mortal. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I'm not sure how long I have stood letting this blood rain fall upon me, but in my self reflection I snapped out of it by, yes, my followers. I hope most of them can find shelter, but Genevieve and Marcel, they were out finding my high priest. I must find them. I will try and sense where is the closest one first. You're feeling the throb in your head, the attraction. Mm. There's a stronger link almost to Genevieve, and again, you're not sure why. It's something linked with your memory. A familiar soul. And she is closest. As you open your eyes, you realise you can open your eyes. You have grown eyeballs and eyelids, and looking down, your hands now have skin. Your <sighs> sechem is reducing but your humanity is at least in appearance increasing yes I look at the skin on my hands feeling a face that feels now a little more human and yes a proper tongue and eyes and yet still just the beginning. But yes, I have not the time for vanity. I must find Genevieve. I will begin walking quickly 
through the storm, not paying too much heed to the mess the blood makes upon me. After all, aside from a bit of blood, the gusts, the howling, the chaos do not affect me at all as I stride towards Genevieve's location. You see through shop windows, through living room windows, even from people taking shelter under trees, those who have somehow found adequate canopies to avoid the worst of this blustering, devastating, plague-like storm, people staring at you with wonder and horror, just walking quite apathetically through the elements. As you pass your way through Paris, you see the wreckage of Nazis, their bodies stripped to the skin. You're not sure how much of that was by the elements, how much of it was by the ghosts that you let loose, how much by maddened French. But they are not moving, and the blood that is on them isn't purely from the rain. You find yourself approaching a tailor's store. As far as your memory is concerned, this kind of thing is really quite familiar now. You're starting to think, yes, clothing, clothing stores, places to pick up apparel. Hmm. Then you can see, just through the blood-smeared window, Genevieve standing over a man, cracking his skull open. I frown as I run towards this door to this this shop and I am concerned I believe Genevieve may be in danger I fling open the door and walk in Genevieve what is happening I turn to the southern voice it takes some time for me to process who exactly is standing in front of me so he looks quite different now but I kind of tilt my head to the side and squint Philippe? Yes. Forgive me, Genevieve. I reach a bloody hand to wipe some blood from my face. Yes, I believe I am more presentable now. Just just blink at him. I still feel a bit disconnected from the world around me. Not really good with feelings, never had been, but there's a sense of emptiness and also feeling very lost. I see you pausing, looking distressed. For a moment I, myself, am confused. But then I remember. I remember that what I have done is quite extraordinary. Even before these feats were extraordinary, yes, this is not normal. I remember that. I think I walk over towards you to place a hand, if you allow me, on your shoulder. I am sorry, my child. I. This is my doing. I let my emotions control me. It is a weakness, I think, of mine sometimes. I will try not to do it again. But I am sorry. I understand. This is alarming. Know that this is my will and the will of the judges. Weakness? Something like that could possibly be a weakness. I just kind of look at him and nod and try to figure out what the next move should be. Oh, yes, I, I did leave on a mission earlier today. Raphael, I went to the apartment. I start to fill in Philippe on what's happened to my little private adventure, that the apartment was ransacked, there was nothing of value. And I think I saw Marcel with a strange man that I feel like I know from somewhere, but I'm not exactly sure. I see. This is troubling. Genevieve. And what of this man here? He was trying to harm you. Just look down at the floor and the mess I've created. 
Yes, he he appeared to be normal at first. He invited me in to take shelter, but then suddenly he just turned against me. Said I was possibly infected, or just it was the ramblings of a madman, and I felt like I had to defend myself. I give your shoulder a reassuring squeeze, and then let go. My apologies. The storm can break the will of many. I wanted to punish the soldiers, the enemy soldiers. I forgot that sometimes the will of the judges is not specific. Hmm. We must go and find Marcel now. Come. One more thing, though, before we leave, Genevieve. And I look at you closely. And I sound like I'm trying to be sympathetic, but then for a moment you do see a little bit, maybe a flash of Sahem in my eyes again, as I say. I have been betrayed, I feel, many times. The one you told me not to trust, you were right, he betrayed us all. I had to end him. I must now ask something of you, because I trust you, Genevieve. I trust you as many, much as anyone I can right now. But you must be honest with me. I remember you from before. What do you mean? I remember you were on a... You were on a scaffold. You were sentenced to death your head rolled from your shoulders and it was you Genevieve and yet I know that was long long ago I think but now you are here would you explain what why this is possible she ponders for a moment should she let him in just a little on the secret or will that doom her it's not entirely sure, but either way, her path ends now, or it will end later. So she decides to you know, kind of gamble on that bit to make sure to look Philippe in the eyes as she tells him a little about her world. We're very Similar to you, I've had past lives. Hmm. You have, and yet you are not my kind. Why have you come to follow me, Genevieve? Please do not tell me you wish for things from me that I cannot give. I am looking for a purpose to continue to exist. It's all seemed so very simple before. You've just looked to survive. But surviving isn't good enough for me. Not as my sole purpose to exist. I'm unsure if I will be able to aid you in all the things you seek, Genevieve. I cannot, for example, give you... The gift, the curse, of my own being. But if you are telling me the truth, I promise I will try to give you purpose. That I can offer. Will that be enough? Only time will tell. I nod slowly. I look you over very closely. And I think I believe you. And I say, thank you for not lying to me, Genevieve. Thank you for trusting me. I shall trust you too. Come. We must aid Marcel. And then we must find my high priest. And then, well, we shall see where things go from there. Come. And I turn to walk out into the storm. But I kind of try and shield Genevieve as best I can. Hoping that at least I can make it a little easier for her to travel. 
and these conditions. It's as if the rain parts to avoid you. The storm, while it still whips and whirls and screams its way through Paris, creates a small vacuum in the immediate vicinity of the mummy to allow you to walk freely and protect your cultist who follows shortly behind. Again, for Genevieve, this pure display of power, conscious or not, something on one hand to envy and some on some level to be in awe of. But how quickly this creature could just snap its fingers if it even needed to and turn that storm on you. It is rather frightening. I was fully aware that if I had said the wrong thing, my life would have ended there. And I feel a bit sad that he said that I can't receive the same gift that he has, but I still feel compelled to stick around. Maybe I'll learn something. Maybe I'll gain at least something small, like just a sliver of this power. And I make my way to where I believe Marcel is. Following Genevieve's directions, you're able to locate the River Seine. It's nothing compared to the river from your memory, the river that cut through your ancestral homeland and while you can't picture it clearly. You know that this is just a hollow imitation. Either way, you make your way to the hatch in the embankment and are able to lift it up. Marcel, you are able to hear more feet climbing their way down the ladder further beyond your chamber. He um, sort of glance back at it for a moment and then at her and then say, more of your friends? Possibly that there are more of us. Please, just let me talk to them. I give you my word. I, 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 nobody will harm you. Um, he gets out of the bath. He keeps the gun on her even though he's... He's hoping to, that she really doesn't put him to use in the gun because he's not particularly good at handling them and never has been. Um, he almost didn't want a gun because it meant he would have to fight, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but he, he sort of keeps it as steadily as he can, trained on her, and then just sort of say, go to the door. And he's trying to bullshit her and remain as calm as he can and seem in control. If I am coming down a ladder, I am going to come down the ladder and move towards... Where I believe Marcel is, there will be no hesitation, no fear. There's a small waterfall of bloody rain making its way down the hatch now, since it was opened briefly for you to climb down. But now that you're in the underground chamber, you find the bathing room easily enough. You find Marcel with a very familiar figure. Genevieve is with you, of course. Trailing behind, slightly nervous. When when Amasis sort of comes in rather than what he expected, uh, he immediately drops to one knee. When I see her, how much do I even remember? Roll your memory. No successes. There's a glimpse, a fragment, a a splinter of a memory. You know that she is someone of importance. But you don't remember her name, you don't remember her face, you don't remember your role. All the horrors of being a creature so powerful with so many holes in his mind come flooding to hit you. You should know this. This is more than frustration, this is cosmic injustice. 
this should be easily knowable. You can bring down storms from the underworld, but you cannot recognize a simple face. I stop for a moment. Something in me again feels that pain, that anger, betrayal, but then I don't know what that means. I step forwards, I glance for a moment longer at this woman, and I look to Marcel. Marcel, are you well? What is going on here? He'll um, rise to his feet when you address him. This one was lingering here with another, and he gestures with his head to a a crumpled figure, I think, probably still lying there, unless he's not, <laughs> in which case I can be enlightened. He's still uh, there. Um, but he would gesture with his head to him, just nodding. They took me prisoner. They took Raphael, your high priest. I, w- I was your high priest, Amasis. I hold out a hand, gesturing for this woman to be silent. And I look to Marcel and motion for him to continue. She knew things about us, about you, and she... She said that you would wish to be merciful. I know you now to be merciful. And so I could only assume that perhaps, yes, she does have knowledge of you. However... Whatever position she may have held in your past, great lord, she has long since forfeited it. She has frittered away your great relics. She has betrayed your mercy. All to extend her own life. She knows nothing of service or loyalty. But you great lord are the judge here and I will not seek to urge you to a course of action I simply wish you to know what I've learned she has used your items your relics to prolong her own life and that of her companion here and My Lord Amasis, I did it all so that I could serve you forever. So that I could be with you the next time you woke. It's not for us to judge who lives and who dies. It is for for the great Lord to do so. And fate. I step over towards this woman. I look to Marcel. One thing you're missing, Marcel. Where is... My high priest. He just looks at the woman. Tell him. He would not divulge your location, my lord. And Charles de Man, our leader, was brutal with him. More brutal than I ever wished, and he handed him over. The name Charles de Man... Does that make me remember something? Roll your memory. Two successes, an eight and a ten. Now there's a name you remember. When the revolution was at the door. An individual who offered you a deal or sought your power or was hungry for what you had. You turned him down. He departed politely, but there was an undercurrent of threat. You knew that the attack on your cult after he had gone was undoubtedly due to his actions. It is in mid-sentence, then, as she was speaking, the place that I strode forwards, yanked her up, by the neck and push her against any surface I can. 
Charles de Man? A servant of Charles de Man is what you are telling me you are? I was, I was your, your servant. He wanted what I could not offer, and when I refused, he did what all petty mortals do, and used violence and misery against me and my, my cult. He even took something important from me. I, and again, it's like I'm trying to remember who she is, but that information is not forthcoming. And it frustrates me. He took I me, to... my lord. He took me from you. Who are you? I was your high priest. My name is Carol, and I... 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 <laughs> please. Please show mercy on me. And there's this feeling of... of deep unhappiness, but I don't know why this woman makes me feel that way, and I do not like it. Marcel, I released the grip just a little, but not very. So, Marcel, she's responsible for... They, they, they traded him to the Germans. The, the ones, the invaders? Yes, great lord. You cooperate with these, these brutal individuals, Carol. Is that what you were telling me again? They were just a means to an end, my lord. We, we don't have, a, I, I've got no affiliation with them. No one who says they serve me would dare say such things. Never. You claim to have served me once. I find that unlikely. I find that you have forgotten everything I have taught. I feel... Betrayal. You know me. Why do I feel betrayal when I look at you, Carol? Answer truthfully. Uh, I... I delivered your... The cult's relics... To... The man... A hundred and fifty years ago. And it was because I was afraid of of dying and losing you. I make a strange motion with my mouth. I'm not sure what it is because I am still quite new to this mouth. And I feel... I think it would be obvious to even Marcel and Genevieve. Is there something happening into one of my eyes? Yes, there is a tear. A tear is coming from my eyes. And for a moment I say nothing as I just hold her there. My lord? I look to... Both of you, Genevieve and Marcel. What would you two do? What would you two do in my place? I look to Marcel, since he is the one who has higher rank in the cult. He actually looks to be pondering this question quite seriously, and he does take his time, um, you know, causing you to have to ask again. Um, but when you do, his eyes um, sort of like come up. If you've taught me anything in the short time I've known you, and the remembrances that Raphael had us read, it was of your mercy, Lord. However, it is for you to decide what form that mercy must take. Truthfully, if it was me, she's betrayed everything I believe in. I, if you had not arrived, I might have killed her before you got here. 
Only she started to speak of you and I thought that she may know things that you needed to hear. But I am not you, Great Lord. I am not of your kind. I am mortal and I will die one day. But hopefully in that time I will have learned something more than she has. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is I wish to learn from you. And if that is to be merciful, even to someone who does not deserve it, then so be it. If that is your judgment, I would not stand in the way. But I do not think we can ever trust her. Ever. I think she cares more for her own life, despite what she says, than any of her notions about wishing to serve you truly. I don't think she truly understands the service that you require. I think maybe I do now. He just leaves that hanging there in the silence. My lord, sometimes mercy is death. There's been many times before I could be reborn in that sense where I had wished for death to take me, to end my suffering. I feel that, or rather I worry that this is another individual, much like Hans, who wished to take your mercy and treat it as a mockery, as if you are naive. fear that she will only bring more suffering to you and to the cult that surrounds you. I didn't listen to either of you before. It seems a bit convenient to me that she would claim to have a position of a high priest in your cult, and yet she associates with a man that you seem to remember as a traitor, possibly? It seems very convenient to me, and it might just be to save her hide, and that she's trying to use your mercy. I didn't listen to you two before, and I am sorry because you were right. On this occasion, my mercy was betrayed. I look to this woman. No, no, please. Please. I wish I could show you mercy. But the truth is, I cannot accept betrayal. I'll do anything, anything to prove my loyalty to you. There is perhaps one last moment where I try and remember why, why is there even hesitation in the first place? And as I do, once again, that blankness, that blankness that is more than just not remembering something, but almost as if there is a cosmic wall denying me this knowledge, perhaps forever, or perhaps only for a short time. I remember nothing of this woman. And I cannot abide betrayal. So I snap her neck. She falls to the ground. Lifeless. With a thump. Her body not far from that of Charles de Man. And I actually moved to you, Marcel. 
and steady myself against you because I do not know why, but I feel terrible. I feel as if there was something deeply important to me, and now it's gone, but I don't know why. I look at you in the eyes and say, my judgment is, is complete, but for some reason, Marcel, I... I feel I regret what I have done. I don't know why. I'm sorry. Uh, coming so close to him, you realise that as you're talking to him and saying those words that Marcel is is weeping, um, and unlike the sort of uh, the kind of zealous follower that he's really been in your presence up until now, um, there's almost a brotherly um, or familial, you know, as you can lean on him, he, he reaches out with his hands and he sort of embraces you as well and um, props you up um, and he, he, he kind of looks straight at you and he um, kind of says and his voice breaking slightly but you can tell he's trying to hold himself together he says it's because you are who you are Lord and if you were not then you would not be worth following at all thank you Marcel And those words, that feeling fades. After all, I I am no longer truly human. Even though this humanity is returning, I still am far from normal. And I calm myself. And I look to the pair of you. My high priest, it seems, is no more. I shall need a new high priest. I cannot think of anyone better than yourself, Marcel. You honour me, Master. It is my pleasure, and Genevieve, I have not forgotten you either. You will certainly be promoted within the cult as well. Thank you, my lord. I suppose the question now is... Oh, and I look at the corpses and this place we're in. What... Now, was there, was there anything else you needed to tell me, Marcel? The bodies, we should, we should give them to the river. That's where they belong. He imagines, again, the, the sight of the black blood that he mistook for almost like an oil slick floating on the surface of the river. Yes. Yes, we will need to find the rest of my followers. We shall need to shelter them. The storm will be over in the morning. Storm, Lord? Ah, you have not seen the storm I brought upon the enemy. I was overzealous, Marcel. I forgot myself. It has wounded the enemy greatly, but also, as Genevieve has seen... I I have harmed some undeserving as well. Perhaps then it will become my place to remind you, Lord, when you are not yourself. I shall accept that. Genevieve. I will stand by your side. And I nod, and I let the pair of them do as they say they will do, and I just wait, calmly thinking on what will happen next. As we're dragging the, the bodies away, um, Marcel, who is no fool, um, and all, as emotional as he was getting, was listening to what was being said there, just as they're dragging the bodies away, turns to Genevieve and says, Reborn? Yes. A bit hesitant to share the truth with Marcel, seeing as, well would rather have that story on a need-to-know basis, but now that he's the high priest, might have to spin a bit of a tale. And so the rest of the night goes with funneling the bodies of these former blood bathers down the sluice and into the Seine. You remain underground for the remainder of the night, so that you are not afflicted by the supernatural malaise of the storm. 
and when you emerge and the blood rains have stopped. Sadly for many, the madness and insensate conditions have far from abated. Paris has changed. Many will not remember the details of what happened. They will see the bodies. They will spy the wreckage. They will have flashes of a supernatural horror. But just as Amasis, Philippe, the mummy, has holes in his memory, so shall the people of Paris. This day and this night will be a nightmare for them. Something they revisit, just in fragments. Only you three, and eventually you two, will remember the full details. And that is where we shall end our story. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the adventure Eternal Reward for Mummy the Curse 2nd Edition. Our Game Master was the Gentleman Gamer Matthew Dawkins, and we were joined by John Burke and Bianca Savazzi, who are both writers for the game. Mummy the Curse had a very successful Kickstarter, and is published by Onyx Path Publishing. The music was made by Beyond the Ghost, and was used with permission from Cryo Chamber. Check out their website on cryochamber.bandcamp.com and their YouTube channel for more wonderful dark ambient. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoyshobear, Nastasha Rollerson, and David for their generous support. And we would of course like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want early access to our content and to hear raw versions of our recordings right after we've done them, or join a campaign of Cult Divinity Lost as a player, please check out our new higher level tiers on Patreon. It's a great way to get more Red Moon role-playing in your life, and to help us keep the show going. Thank you again for listening, and see you soon, again.